Joel David Rifkin was born on the 20th of January, 1959. His parents were very young at the time of his birth and were not settled together in a home or even in their relationship. So they thought it was best to send Rifkin to be adopted. He was adopted by Bernard and Jean Rifkin when he was three. He took their surname and had spent from the age of two weeks old in care until the Wright family came along for him. His home was in East Meadow, New York, with his adoptive parents, happy as a family. At school, Rifkin didn't have many friends due to his incredibly poor social skills. His IQ test came back at a score of 128, which showed that Rifkin had superior intelligence. But this didn't help him in school. His severe dyslexia held him back. He graduated from East Meadow High School and went on to go to a few different colleges, but never earned a degree. Rifkin was incredibly interested in horticulture and photography. So when he left school, he worked as a landscaper freelance. In February, his adoptive father, Bernard, became very ill. After tests, he was diagnosed with prostate cancer and towards the end, he was in a lot of pain. Then on the 20th of February, 1987, Bernard took his own life to get away from the pain of terminal cancer. This in turn broke Rifkin's heart. The man who always supported him was no longer there to do this. He had deep affection for the man who brought him up. Now feeling like he had to be the man of the family, this put a lot of pressure onto Rifkin. Pressure he didn't seem to cope too well with. Rifkin never had many girlfriends. He seemed to not be able to talk to women, something that was evident from a young age. So he used the services of local prostitutes to satisfy his needs. There was no need to make conversation with these women. Only six months after his father's death, Rifkin was arrested in Hempstead, New York. He had been caught offering an undercover policewoman money for sex. This was during the time the police were trying to clear up some of the very well-known red light district areas in New York. On the 20th of February 1989, on the two-year anniversary of his father's death, Rifkin went on the prowl looking for another prostitute to use her services, a pastime that he had enjoyed for many years. Even throughout college, he used whatever money he had on using prostitutes. The woman in question was named Heidi Bulch. He took her back to his home in East Meadow while his mother and sister were away on holiday. And he killed her after a night of drink and sex. What happened next was to shock all in New York. Heidi's body was dismembered and parts of her were put all over town, her head eventually making its way to the seventh hole on the Hopewell, New Jersey golf course. This must be the work of one incredibly crazy person. Once the head was discovered, the media frenzy scared Rifkin which made him promise himself that this would be a one-time murder, a mistake that would not happen again. Although we know the person now as Heidi, she in fact wasn't identified until 2013. Rifkin kept all of his murder intent burning inside of him, but it bubbled continuously, and in 1990, it got the better of him. Again, his sister and mother were on holiday, so Rifkin went on to peruse for a woman to pick up. He found Julia Blackbird and took her back to the family home. After leaving to get money to pay for her services, upon his return, he murdered her. He strangled and beat her. Her body was put into large cans, weighted down with concrete, and they were tossed into the East River and some in the Brooklyn Canal. 
hoping that these parts would not be found and linked to Heidi's murder. These murders all took place in the basement of his family home, completely unbeknown to his family. Although we know about this crime, her remains were never actually found and given back to her family. Rifkin became confident that he was the perfect killer. He hadn't been caught so far. His victim type, in his mind, was perfect. Prostitutes and drug addicts. Women who spent a lot of time on the streets. Women who may not have family missing them. But Rifkin was not happy with his methods of disposing the bodies. He needed a cleaner way to do this. Less blood was what he had in mind. Then in 1991, Rifkin's murders just kept coming. Barbara Jacobs was victim three. She had been killed in July and disposed of in the Hudson River. Next was Mary DeLuca. She was killed in the September of that very same year. Yun Lee was also murdered in September. She was strangled and dumped into the East River, a river that Rifkin had used for a few of his victims. Another woman who has not been identified was murdered in December of 1991. She was put into a huge oil drum and dumped into the East River again. Lorraine Orvieto was picked up from Baby Shore, Long Island and was strangled. Her body was also put into an oil drum and tossed into the Coney Island River. She was the last murder of 1991. Then 1992 came and women were still being murdered. Mary Holloman was killed in January and dumped in Coney Island Creek. Iris Sanchez was killed in May and dumped at a site by JFK Airport. Anna Lopez in May and was dumped along the I-84 in Putnam County. Violet O'Neill was murdered in June. She was killed at his mother's home. She was cut up and disposed of into different canals along New York. Mary Williams was killed and again this happened at his mother's home. All the family still unaware what was happening in their own home. Jenny Soto was killed in November and was found the next day in Harlem River, New York. Leah Evans was killed, then buried in the woods on Long Island in February 1993. A new year of killings had begun. Laura Marquez was next. She was killed and was left in Pine Barrens in Long Island. Tiffany Bresciani, she was the final victim of this heinous killer. She was also a prostitute and was looking for business in her usual area of Allen Street in Manhattan. She was approached by Rifkin, who was in a Mazda pickup truck. She told her boyfriend, who was there at the time, that she would be back in 20 minutes. But when she failed to return, her boyfriend reported her missing and gave a description of the man in the car that she was last seen with. By this time, Rifkin had already strangled her. He placed her in the trunk under some tarpaulin that he had previously bought and calmly drove the car home. It was his mother's car and it was now daylight and his mother had asked for the keys to the car to run her own errands. Unaware, there was a dead body laying in the trunk all the time she was using it. When she returned with the car, he was worried that his secret had been unveiled and that his mother would have called the police on him. But he realised that surprisingly she hadn't noticed the body and so he moved her. It was still daytime, so couldn't dispose of her properly just yet. So he left her body in the garage at his mother's house while he pondered about what to do with her. The June weather was warm and the body began to smell. So Rifkin had to do something about it and soon. On the 28th of June, he wrapped up Tiffany's body in tarpaulin and put her back in the trunk of his car and decided he would drive 
to one of his trusty rivers. As he was driving, a patrol car noticed that the licence plate at the back of the Mazda was missing, so they proceeded to stop the car to let the driver know. They flashed their lights in a pullover fashion. Panicked by this, Rifkin continued to drive, ignoring the state trooper's request. Then the siren was heard, and Rifkin again refused to stop. Continuing to check his rearview mirror, Rifkin began to miss the turn he was after. He turned last second and drove into a streetlight pole. Rifkin was handcuffed by the troopers, who had in turn asked for backup. The smell of Tiffany's body was pungent, and police knew exactly what the smell was, and then found the decomposing body of Tiffany hidden under the carefully placed tarpaulin. When questioned, Rifkin offered a lame excuse that it was a mistake, that he didn't mean to kill her, then asked the police if they felt that he needed a lawyer. Rifkin was questioned in Hempstead, New York Police Headquarters for a period of time. Then, he shockingly began to tell them the magnitude of what he had done and even gave them the number 17. A search was to take place of his mother's home. The room that Rifkin slept in was searched and many items were found. Items that belonged to the massive 17 victims that this man callously killed. Purses, driving licence, photos and makeup. These were all trinkets he kept to remind him of who he had killed. Then the garage was searched. A wheelbarrow was found which still had Tiffany's blood in it. Tools that had been used to cut up the bodies, all with blood and hair still on them. Rifkin spent time writing a document for police, telling them where to find the bodies and where he took them from. The police were able to find 17 victims and identify 15 at the time. A trial was set. Big time lawyers were hired by Rifkin, adamant that he would be found not guilty. The team argued that the evidence relating to Tiffany should not be admissible due to the fact that they had no right to stop Rifkin on a traffic violation, let alone search his car. A plea deal was offered, 46 year prison sentence for the admission of guilt on all murders. Rifkin denied this plea, still hoping that the lawyers would get him off of all charges. The jury disagreed with the not guilty plea and sentenced Rifkin to 25 years to life in prison for the murder of Tiffany. Then he was transferred to Suffolk County to stand trial for the murder of two of the other victims, Leah and Lauren. This time, Rifkin pled guilty and was given two consecutive life terms. Trials were also set in Queens and Brooklyn to make this man who is now known as the most prolific serial killer in New York history, responsible for his actions. By the time the trial had finished, he had been found guilty of the murders of nine women and had clocked up a total of 203 years in prison. Joel David Rifkin is now being held at the Clinton Correctional Facility in New York in solitary confinement due to the huge media storm that surrounded this case. They feel he would be safer there than in general population and he will remain